So in CS 220, uh, we learned some basic web scraping stuff. And in this course, uh, we've done more. We've used uh, Selenium so we can scrape pages that have JavaScript on them. And, um, and we've also thought about how we can do some general web crawling across many pages. Uh, but all of these things that we've done in both the courses so far have been what we might call client side. We're writing programs that ask for data from some web servers. And so what I want to spend at least a little bit of time in this course doing is thinking about the other side of the picture. Um, how do we build an application that might respond with data when people ask for it? And um, there's lots of reasons why this might make sense in a data science course. Um, if you have some sort of data set and you want to share it with the world, maybe you have to have some sort of web API uh, where various clients can kind of make queries and, and grab different pieces of, of data, right? So, and, and so that's one piece. You might end up writing applications like that that kind of serve up data. Um, and then the other piece is, is if you understand how that backend works, uh, it's going to make more sense to you how you might write a client that requests data. And, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about how the internet works in general and networks work. And some of this is has an overlap from CS220, uh, but I think it's good to see again. Um, the, the way you should think of computers is as maybe these buildings uh, that have some sort of street address. But instead of a street address, uh, they have what we call an IP address. And um, there's different kinds of IP address, but a very common format is where we have kind of like these four um, parts, right? These four numbers separated by periods. Um, your laptop, actually, I'm not showing it here, but that will also have um, some sort of IP address. And, and so a network, right, is any case where we have two computers or more in the world that are talking to each other. And, um, and so here I have this laptop that's talking with this computer over here that I'm kind of drawing as, as this big building. And, um, and so when you send a request from a program, uh, you have to say, well, what IP address do I want to send that request to? And, and we won't get into the details of routing, but somehow the internet figures out if I send a request to this IP address, ultimately you'll end up at that at that computer there, right? And, uh, and so that's all, all. And I could have different programs that could send these requests from my laptop. Maybe I have my Chrome browser. Um, may, maybe I have like an SSH session running. Uh, maybe I have a Python program. It could look like lots of different things. Okay, so why have I drawn this computer as an apartment building? Uh, well, because I want you to think of it as having these kind of different components um, inside of it. Uh, there are gonna be different programs um, running on a computer, and uh, and I kind of think of them as occupying different apartments within a building. And, and so if I want to send a uh, request to somebody, I can't just send it to the building. I have to say what apartment number I want. And, and kind of working with that analogy, what we'd call that here um, is a port number, right? So when I send that request, I'm going to say both the IP address and colon and then the port number to make sure it actually ends up talking um, to the program I'm, I'm interested in. Okay, so, so let's uh, try to get away from apartment buildings and, and try to have a closer look at this picture. Um, in order to really understand um, ports and what it takes to get a message to a program, um, I'm going to talk about some different problems that could arise. Um, one problem that could arise is that uh, there could be a firewall. Here I have a firewall that might block requests. And, um, and it's possible a firewall could block certain requests, like maybe to 2020, uh, but not to port 22. Right? And, and so in that case, maybe I can't reach Jupyter, uh, but I could reach this SSH program. Actually, on all your VMs, there's an SSH program running all the time. And when you run SSH on your laptop, what you're doing is you're trying to talk um, talk to that program over here um, on the right. And just kind of the tradition is that SSH always listens on port 22, right? Um, but you know you could configure it otherwise. Okay, and so you can punch different holes in, in the firewall by configuring it. Um, in our course, uh, you know, we're more worried about kind of convenience and security. So like the first thing I had you do on lab one was just to completely disable this firewall. And that would not be a good thing to do. Like if you're working in, you know, a company, maybe you're working with banking information or something else very private, um, it'd be better to kind of be very judicious about what you open up and what you don't. Now, there might be other issues. Um, about kind of getting through, even if I open up that port number 2020, uh, maybe there is no process listening here, right? So I might send this request, but it doesn't really get anywhere. So, okay, so I'll start a process and I say that process is listening on port 2020. And, uh, and then there's this kind of funny thing. You can show that I have this ear, which represents listening. 
And um, there's multiple ways to listen when you're running on, on a computer. And um, one way to listen is just to kind of listen to other programs on, on the same computer. And, and so even though every machine has an IP address like this, every machine also has an IP address, which is 127.0.0.1. Um, that's actually a good number to remember. That's like the local host um, address. And if I start a program, like let's say I start Jupyter Notebooks like this, I say Python 3, run notebooks, no browser, IP equals this on this port 2020. I'll start that process, but it's only listening to other programs on here. So, you know, if somehow I was able to start Chrome on the same laptop, then I could use Jupyter. But if I have a separate computer over here who's trying to access it via this IP address, well, nobody's going to respond to me. Um, right, so that would be kind of my third um, third issue, right? So the, the key when I start up is to listen on this IP address, that's kind of public facing. And um, a convenient way to do that is just say 0 .0 .0 .0. Um That's kind of just a shortcut to say, hey, listen on, well, I guess really everywhere, um, including kind of this public facing one. So, so that's why in lab one, I told you to start it up this way, right? We want to listen on port 2020, right? So I'm doing that. And we want to kind of listen to outside traffic, so I'm doing that. And then I told you to open up the firewall. And, and if you did all those things correctly, well, then hopefully you can connect next to your Jupyter process and see what's going on. And then at the same time, you're connecting with SSH on port 22 to the SSH program. So you can both run uh, kind of bash commands via SSH and then and then run kind of uh, your Jupyter, Jupyter notebooks. So at this point, we've had success, and we can kind of talk to both programs. OK, so I'm going to do a little demo here uh, where I'm going to start up another process. And, uh, and then I'm going to see how I can connect to it from, from Chrome. And uh, this is a little bit dangerous, right? I mean, if you don't do it right, it's very easy that you could kind of accidentally share all your private data um, you know, on the internet with people. And well, you know, I've had people do this before, and not necessarily in this class, but you know, it's not the chances aren't tiny that somebody will take advantage of that and, and kind of uh, exploit your virtual machine. But anyway, I'm gonna head over here and um, and let me go to my, let me go to my, um, I'm gonna head over to my virtual machine like so. And what am I gonna do here? I'm gonna make a simple website and, um, and kind of have it be public on the internet. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new directory. I'm going to say make directory website demo. And uh, this is very important that I, I do the new directory first and then cd to it. Um, let, let me do ls and good. So I see there's nothing here. Uh, before you do what I do next, make sure um, you're kind of in a directory where there is nothing. Otherwise, you're going to be kind of making public whatever is in the directory where I run this thing. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say sudo, well actually let me just try this first, I'm going to say python3 and then dash mod dash m and, and when I do dash m I can have uh, any sort of module here and so this is a way that people actually uh, kind of run python programs. So for example um, if I ran this I'd be running the pip module and I might use that to install something like pandas. If I say notebook well then I'd be running the Jupyter notebook module and kind of running that and so another module that comes with Python is called http.server. And, uh, and so I'm going to run that. And, uh, and well, what do I see here? I see that it's, it's serving HTTP traffic on 000. zero, zero. So that, that's good. That means it's public, right? So that's good. And then I'm, I'm doing it on port 8000. Um, if I wanted to, I could have tried a different port. Like I could have said uh, port 80. And... It'll actually complain because uh, you need to have special permissions to do that. I'd have to say something like sudo to listen on port 80. Uh, there's certain small port numbers that require extra permissions, but I'm just going to run it like this for now. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do is head over to Chrome and uh, let's just kind of see what's going on here. Um, I want to visit my, my website, right? So. So maybe I'm just going to head here so I can remember my IP address. And, uh, and this is my IP address here. And so I'm going to open up a new tab. And I'm going to type that. And, um, and I'm not going to get anything because by default, when I just type an IP address, it's looking at port um, 80. 
and I'm actually on port, you know, 8,000. All right, so let me, I see all of this still. So I'm actually gonna try typing this now. I'm gonna say port colon 8,000. And, and now I can actually see I have this sort of directory uh, listing thing, right? And, and what is this? So let me head back here and kind of see where I, I was. I was inside of this directory called web demo and, and there's nothing really here. And that's why I'm not seeing anything here, right? So in this web demo directory, let me actually create a file. Um, I'm gonna call that file, uh, let, let me rename it. I'm gonna call it, um, let's say like page1.html. And then I'll say something like, hello world. Maybe let me make it like bold like this, just so it's a little bit more exciting. And, um, and so then if I come back here and I refresh, I can see while well, there actually is this file. And if I want to, well, what am I doing here? So let me just try to type something here and then I'll talk about what it's doing. So if I say like page1.html, um, there's like three parts here. When I, when I hit enter, it's going to send a request to my web server. So, so what this does is it gets it to my virtual machine, right? That's the IP address of my virtual machine. And then uh, this port number, well, it'll kind of figure out who's listening there. And guess what? Uh, the, the web server is listening there on, on port 8000. And then it, it finally says to the web server, please send me page1.html. So I'm going to do that. And now I can actually see, well, it gave me back that page and I can uh, see what's going on just fine, right? And, and actually, let me just try to refresh this again. I think it kind of got wacky. You can see every time I, I refresh, it, it can show what page I'm looking for. And, and of course, if I look for something like, you know, page 2.html, um, you can see up here, right, that the web server got that request profile doesn't have, so it gave back a 404. And, and then that's what I see below um, as well, right? So, so again, right, the reason why I ran this in this empty directory where I only have my HTML stuff is like, well, you know, imagine you had like your project code here, right? Maybe somebody would like look for, you know, p1.ipynb and, and pretty soon they would steal your, um, steal your work, right? Well, I guess they would do that here, right? They could look for like, you know, p1.ipynb and steal your code uh, or, or worse, your, your SSH keys. That would be very terrifying, actually. Um, so, so one more detail here uh, that I think is worth noting is that let's say I just go to this page right here, just kind of directly go to that site. Um, this is kind of just giving me some sort of default thing, but I'd really like to have some sort of home page here. And so, so it's traditional that if I create a file called um, index.html, then that is going to be my home page. All right, so I'm going to say welcome to my home page like that and I may use these h1 headers so it's really big and, and then if I refresh that instead of getting a directory listing I'll actually kind of see um, see whatever I have on that page now I want to be very clear right this is not kind of a demo I'm just running on my computer uh, I'm going to turn off the server soon and actually maybe I'll just do it now I'll hit control C here and after I do control C until my server well the website is gone but while it was up, I mean, if we were doing this as a live lecture, you could have absolutely typed in this IP address and this port number and, uh, and visited my website. So it's not actually that hard to kind of create a website uh, that other people on the internet can visit and find. And of course, that's why we want to be careful about what files we have there. <clears throat> so I think I'm imagining people are kind of curious about what else it would take to turn this into a real website. So, um, well, first off, okay, just a little bit of, of detail here. So on P4, you are going to be building a real website that will kind of listen on a port like this. But what, what would it take to kind of make this um, more real? I think one thing that would take is that, you know, these IP addresses are kind of weird. I think people are a little sketched out if you say like, oh, type in this number in, in your Chrome browser. People are used to typing things like, you know, google.com or example.com, um, things like that. And, and so how, how is it that we have both IP addresses and then also these nice um, domain names, we might call them? And, uh, and the answer is that the internet has, has this service called the domain name uh, service. And, uh, and you can see here, I'm running this machine down here um, that's running a domain name service. And just like other machines, it has an IP address. So for example, this one has 8.8.8.8. .8 um, that's actually the IP address of Google's domain name service. And the way you should think of a domain name service is that 
it kind of has this giant dictionary, right? And so, so you can see here, right? I have like a Python dictionary here, and um, and there's like a domain name here, and it's saying, well, this is the IP address for that domain name. And so what happens when I am on my web browser and I say go to example.com, the first thing it's trying to do is it's trying to send a request to um, to a domain name service at a specific IP address. There's a good chance a lot of you um, have computers that are configured to use this as your domain name service, even though you haven't really thought about it, right? But it'll kind of send it here. And then it'll figure out, well, example.com is actually this IP address. And it's trying to send that back. And then Chrome will be smart enough to send the request here, right? And so it'll kind of get to that machine. And um, and you as a user, right, whoever is typing in Chrome never really had to even realize that that was what the IP address was. It just kind of all happens uh, seamlessly. Um, now, these DNS servers, actually anybody could create one and um, and you could put whatever you wanted in it. So, so for example, if I kind of created my own domain name service and then I configured my web browser or my computer to use it, well, <laughs> That'd be kind of awesome because then I could, uh, for myself, I could reserve google.com or facebook.com, anything I wanted. And uh, well, nobody else would see it, but but I guess I would, right? So there's kind of like an official version of what should go um, inside of this dictionary. And, um, and, and the way you get your domain name in there is you pay, pay some small fee, you know, maybe 10 to $15 a year. And then you'll be kind of in all the domain name uh, service dictionaries, whether that's uh, you know Google's one or other ones, and, and so it's not very expensive, right? I mean, that's kind of less than uh, much less than it would cost to actually be running a VM, right? So that's kind of a nominal nominal fee you would pay to get in there. Okay, so that's kind of the setup. That's how we would get there. One other detail that I want to talk about is um, HTTP versus HTTPS, um, and uh, so we used to have HTTP, a Hypertext Transfer Protocol, and it was a protocol where I would kind of say you know, send a GET request to this IP address and then to this server. And then we would say a resource that we want. Like maybe I want page1.html. And, uh, and so that would work fine. Uh, but this traffic wasn't encrypted. So if I was on Wi-Fi or something, uh, totally possible somebody else in the room um, could, uh, could on their laptop install a program. For, for example, there's one called Wireshark. And they could basically see all your HTTP traffic. They could read your emails. They could see what pages you're visiting. Um, any of that, you know, I remember like, me and my friends were trying to do that for fun. We'd be in a class and we'd just kind of have this open and, and we'd see what everybody is browsing instead of kind of paying attention to the lecture, right? So that's not great, right? That's not very private. And so uh, instead of HTTP, uh, they eventually uh, switched over to HTTPS. It's, more now, more, it's now more common. And that's just hypertext transfer protocol secure, meaning it's encrypted. So you can do that still. And then, you know, if anybody's snooping, they won't really see what's there. Um, now to encrypt like that, you're gonna have to pay for something called an SSL uh, certificate uh, for for that encryption. And uh, again, that's not too expensive. I mean, that might be like five to ten dollars a year, right? So kind of end to end, right? If you wanted to uh, create a website, what would you do? You'd probably uh, pay for a virtual machine, uh, start running some server on there, maybe like a Python server. Uh, pay for a DNS name that maps to your IP address of your virtual machine. And then maybe pay for and configure an SSL certificate so you could have HTTPS and while well, you would have a legitimate site uh, kind of up and running uh, for the world.